he was looking for a grey model and he had interviewed uh, Maya Musk, I think, and some seriously big names. And I came very cheap. I almost paid him to get the job. They didn't even ask if I could model. It was, you got grey hair, we need a grey model. Uh, come to London and meet the photographer and see if you're going to work for us. When I say it's the best day of my life, my daughter gets very upset and says, what, you're supposed to be when I was born? One shoot does not make you a model at all. It's like, you need to be seen. You need to be going out there and keep moving forward. Or do you want to just settle down and say, uh, one hit wonder? Welcome to the show, Caroline. It's great to catch up with you after, what's it been? Two years, three years since we last worked together? I feel like I have known you forever. <laughs> when we first arrived in Dubai 12 years ago, we went to the races and there was this little thing, if I may call you that, petite, uh, with pixie cut hair and just gorgeous. And I thought, I'd love to meet her one day. <laughs> you've got such a good memory from the World Cup to us working together to build your brand, build your business and to where you are now. So I know a little bit of your backstory but not everyone watching and listening does so over to you to maybe share a little bit of kind of what you've been up to and your big kind of defining moment that happened what when you were was it your late 40s or were you in your 50s? 53. 53 so over to you and give us a little bit of a backstory. I get confused about when my birthday is, so the, the story differs between 53 and 54. But I was here in Dubai working as a receptionist in a school and quite happy in that job. Uh, half day, worked really well. And then I was offered a modeling job in London, which I said yes to randomly because I had not modeled before, had never aspired, well, since I was about 15 or 16 when I was singing into the hairbrush uh, to be a model. And oh my gosh, I loved every minute of it. And it was, everything worked. It was one of those days where everything fell into place and it just felt great it felt fantastic so how does someone call you up out of the blue like had you put together a modeling contract like you know had you put together a, a line sheet or how how did how does that even happen uh, mimi was working for a guy in london and he was looking for a gray model and he had interviewed uh, maya musk i think and some seriously big names and I came very cheap. I almost paid him to get the job because they had said that it was going to be in British Vogue, which it was uh, eight times in the first year. And I literally could have bitten his hand off. So I was, I, I mean, I don't know if he knew that it was going to work as well as it did either, but it was the best, one of the, when I say it's the best day of my life, my daughter gets very upset and says, what you're supposed to be when I was born. <laughs> so just to clarify, Mimi is your daughter, and was she already modelling? She was. She left school early to go to London and model, yes. So she's been modelling since she was about 15. And you've done a few shoots together now, haven't you? We have. We have. We did. I, when I say I never modelled before, I uh, actually we were at the races and randomly this guy, who was a little bit tipsy, as the majority of people are at the races at the Absolutely. end. Really to come on and so this guy came up and said I want to photograph you and I sort of pushed my daughter in front of me and said this is the model and uh, here's her phone number as a mother does he said no no I want to photograph you and it, I was so uncomfortable we did it and it was all legit and it was great it was in Harper's Bazaar actually Arabia I literally hid behind her it, I felt so uncomfortable there was nothing fluid about it and then fast forward, you were in British Vogue eight times in the first year in your first contract. Yes, and naked. Naked. Um, for those that haven't seen the shot, what I'm going to do is in the show notes, I'll actually place, wanna, is the image on your website? Or have you got a link that you can share? I think it's on your website. Uh, possibly. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll put your website details below so people can go and have a look. So you get this phone call out of the blue. Can you model? You agree to go and do this. You do it. And they didn't even ask if I can. They didn't even ask if I could model. It was, you've got grey hair, we need a grey model. Uh, come to London and meet the photographer and see if you're going to work for us. 
that's what you did and then it all happens. Maybe let's go a step back a little bit. So the grey hair has been your sort of signature. When did you start going grey? And then maybe let's lead into sort of this bit because it's something that so many women, like something that you've embraced going grey, so many women don't and it led to an amazing opportunity. Yes. And it upsets me actually when people say, why have you gone grey but you're not 100% natural? So yes, I do Botox. Yes, I've had a lower facelift. Yes, I've had a brow lift over the, over the last eight years or so. I did those things to make myself feel better about myself. Grey hair, it just seemed to be a hair colour to me. And I really believe very strongly that your complexion changes as your hair colour changes. And I suit grey hair. My mum's been grey since she was 20 something and she suits grey hair. When did you go grey then? Well, probably late 20s, but didn't actually allow it to come out. Well, actually, no, I take that back. I came to Dubai grey 12 years ago. Every woman I met said, you can't be grey in Dubai. So <laughs> Immediately dyed it, went for the, the false eyelashes, the nails and uh, blonde hair. I'd love to see a picture of that. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got that you've embraced um, grey hair, you get the phone call, you go and do the shoot, you come back, then what happens? Do you just think, oh, this is a, a one-off? Or do you go, oh, I quite like this, could I see if there's a business in it? You are part of that story. I came back thinking, oh, I made it, I was amazing, I'm in British Vogue, came back here, no one knew. It's hard to find British Vogue these days actually here and uh, no one knew anything and one shoot does not make you a model at all. So what was I going to do? I was going to get more photographs that that is the only thing every time you speak to somebody they say you need to go and you need genre, different genres you need to work with lots of different people and create different faces different clothes and that's exactly what I did and then I contacted you because I wanted to I don't know, try and find out where I belonged here that's a really tricky thing do you want to fight and keep moving forward or do you want to just settle down and say uh, one hit wonder and you really made that decision you know when I you know when we started working together it was like you know because I think you just left did you not just left the school around about that time and you're like do you know what because I remember us going through sort of aspects of budget and going right this is what we need to bring in this is what we need to manage this is what we should be charging that you know and all these things it was like how can we get more clients in and I guess in some ways it's you are the business so you're offering a service much like i offer a service through mentoring you're offering a service it's just you are that service and you've still got to run it as a business so i remember we we did your website for you and we got your branding out there your logo everything um came together there and then you started to get some work here so what was that journey like and because i know certainly in the past two or three years it's exploded more Maybe tell us a little bit about that journey. I think people became interested in maybe who does she think she is? Why does she think that we should be photographing her? And I was very lucky and worked with some good photographers here and some good makeup artists, Hindash being one of them, and Nikki Makeup in London. Luck is part of it, but also saying yes to every opportunity. You need to be, you know what it's like, you need to be seen. You need to be going out there and putting your name on the board because it, no one else is going to do it. Did you sign yourself up to other agencies? I did. Here I'm with a lot of agencies. In Europe I'm with one and here again it's a different ball game. You don't really get looked after by somebody. I have a great agent here now, Abdul the agent, and he really, he looks after me. I know he's got my back and that is making a big difference. I remember when we were initially talking and it was, there was quite a lot of frustration, I think, because in the UK or in Europe, shall we say in general, you know, it was okay to go grey in the US, you know, there was a lot of grey hair models making it really big. And then here it was like, they didn't want the realness of what someone could actually offer. No, and I still don't fit that mold because I still get those WhatsApp messages saying, there's a job looking for a granny. 
age uh, old woman age 50 to 65. Is that the jobs that are being offered here in the UAE? And do you take them? Uh, no. I did the uh, old granny, the wire glasses and drawing wrinkles on my face and stuff. But if you're going to pay me to do that proper fee, then I'll do it. But I'm not just going to be a token granny in the corner. So what other projects have you worked on? I'm not a granny yet, and I'm very much looking forward to that. But I, I don't think that a perception of a granny is necessarily the way forward. And things have changed. Um, what kind of jobs have you worked on recently? Or what kind of you know exciting things have you been, have you travelled to? What have you worked on? A Finnish advert where I had to speak Finnish. Jeez Louise, that is hard language. I had to, we were in the desert and I had to look as if I was hovering. So they put me on a precarious table and I had to sit there in a yoga pose. Yeah, it was very hot and then I had to speak. It was for a mobile phone company, I think. I had to speak Finnish. I can't speak Finnish, is the result of that. Did it go ahead though? Did you manage to speak enough for the event? No. The problem with most of these jobs, you don't necessarily, unless somebody contacts you and says, oh, I saw you. Yeah, I did a, a, an advert for the Langham, which they've just renewed. And then I only hear, oh, I saw you on the aeroplane. Otherwise, I have no idea. Through someone else. That's so interesting that they don't share that. Um, now, I know social media has also played a big role in what you're doing in terms of visibility and your personal brand. When did you first go on Instagram and when did it start to kind of pick up traction for you? I was on Instagram like many people are, but looking at things. And it wasn't until I got those amazing shots that I thought, I want to share these with the world because I have never felt so beautiful, even on my wedding day. And I just want everybody to see this because I didn't even, I felt it was sort of an out of body experience. I s still look at them and think, gosh, that's me. Um, and, and so I wanted to share that. So I, so I shared those and then I would put up the occasional picture and then I'd get Mimi saying, oh, you've got to take that picture down. You can't put that picture up. And that took, quite a lot of sorting out in my head until I realized that what I'm posting is f for me. I It's things that I want to post, therefore I'm gonna post them. So rather than you seeing yourself as a brand, it's actually you posting things you want to post and connecting with people. Well, it is, but I stay away from politics and that sort of thing because it just, I, I don't like confrontation at all. And, there are enough people doing that. I have very strong views, but um, that's not what my page is about. But I meant from the point of view of Mimi saying you shouldn't do that, or you can't do that. There is no such word as can't, mum always used to say, and shouldn't, shouldn't be used. So you went against the advice of um, some, of your daughter and someone younger that you might automatically be thinking, well, she knows best and you embraced what you felt was right with your audience and what you wanted to post. And and that strategy has worked for you. Well, how many followers are you sitting at, at the moment on Instagram? 440, I think. The algorithm is doing something weird um, and it's not, it's really stagnant. But I can, depending on who I've worked with, I can zoom up three or 4,000 and then it, dies off and you know I have no idea what I don't understand algorithms they just happen because I think when we were working you were maybe at around 30 40,000 thereabouts so it's grown considerably yeah and it's reposting and restorying for sure because if one I remember one day a makeup artist in Saudi messaged me and said I've just um, storied you or posted you and everybody loves you and I literally zoomed up I don't know, four or 5,000 overnight. Those that are, are listening, so reposting stories, so other people reposting your stories. And how many story posts do you do a day? Not enough. Ooh, one for, one for the brand strategy then. Yes, I have been, I remember somebody telling me that you should do 20 stories a day. And I, I know that's big, isn't it? But, it, but he had a lot of followers, so it was obviously working for him. I think it depends what, who your tribe is. You, how much do they want to see of you a day, really? The stats that I've read have said if you can consistently do between four and five posts a day, I tend to find when someone's doing 20 or 30, 
oh, like I get bored after 10 and I'm like, skip it. And the only way that I would ever have sort of 20 would be if it was an event and other people were posting and I was reposting theirs. That would be the only thing. So it would be rare that it would be a lot, but they say as long as you're posting four to five times a day, it actually works. But I still have an issue with creating my stories when I'm out, like when, when I bumped into you the other night. And creating all of these stories, either you're gonna sit there on your phone and be antisocial and do the stories, which you're kind of being paid to do, or you do them all and then story them afterwards, or even story them the next day. That That's a real quandary for me. I would do it, I don't do it in the moment. So I always, and I tend to take the picture of the actual camera rather than using the app as well. So the, the resolution tends to be a little bit better. And then if I'm taxiing home from an event, that's when I will do the story or when I get into bed, or I'll do it in the morning. But I would say it would always be after the event. I think that way you can actually create a story of that particular event rather than just sort of, oh, I'm posting now when you're like, you could get a better shot later on. That's happened before where you've put, I've posted something and then later on I've got a better shot and it's like, well, I've already posted it, but I've had another one. But sometimes it can be three or four days where you are sent the images if you yes that's absolutely true and then you can and then i think then it misses the point exactly totally yeah i i do agree with that are you on any other social media it's still a learning curve and it, quite an exciting one things do change quite fast i don't know if i'm keeping up <laughs> well i mean real content at the moment on instagram in particular seems to be what the algorithm is actually pushing have you had much success with other platforms i think i've done one tiktok but apparently i have three accounts on tiktok none of them are mine oh how interesting so someone's taken your name and used that and i don't seem to be able to delete them so and i just gave up trying to delete them wow and what about youtube uh yes I've done a bit of YouTube, uh, talking to some pretty incredible doctors. That's been a bit of a theme. Um, whatever issue I'm going through or whatever issue people message me about, then I try and interview doctors at King's College Hospital who I've partnered up with. They're mostly British doctors and pretty good. Nice. So if you don't mind me asking, what age are you now? Uh, what am I? 57, 58 in July. Is that next month? It is indeed. And when, you know, 58 years old, I know that you work out a lot, you look after your skin. Talk to me about your routine or what it is you actually do to maintain, I guess, the way that you look so that the likes of British Vogue will call you back up again and say, you know, can you come and, and do this? What does your routine look like and what is it that you do? I am ashamed, no, I'm not ashamed to say. I was going to say I'm ashamed to say. I'm not really exercising at the moment. I'm walking the dogs, pretty much that's all I'm doing. I'm, I was going to enter a bikini fitness competition and started to get incredibly bulky, which completely freaked me out. I did not, I, I enjoyed the process, but I did not enjoy what it was doing to my body. I like to be lean. I've always been a runner. So I stopped cold turkey and yeah, I'm just walking the dogs. For me then, it's sleep. The most important thing not eating too much and eating a low carb diet which doesn't suit everybody but i've been doing it for most of my life and yeah a bit of walking i will get back into running and i definitely want to run another ultra marathon with david but just not yet so david's your husband and you've been running for years though i remember that running was a big part of your lifestyle yeah kind of so, but I like to be lean, so whatever is the quickest route to being lean for me, uh, and that has always been running. Uh, but I ran my first marathon when I was 50, so I was never competitive. So what's next then? What's next for Caroline? What are you working on? What projects are in the, the pipeline? What can you share? I haven't really got anything up my sleeve at the moment. I'm going to London next week to meet up with a few people. Uh, then back here for the summer. And you know Dubai is incredibly quiet during the summer. So moving house, that's the biggest thing that's going on in our life. And it's kind of kind of blinkered uh, because this is, a, this is our first owned home in 31 years of marriage. And that's, you've traveled a lot around, your husband's been in the military, that's right, isn't it? 30 years, yeah. Yeah, so now you've 
made the UAE your home. I'd honestly, if you'd asked me a year ago, that was not that was not on the radar. I remember when we worked together, and this was something that I wanted to talk about. There's a couple of bits in terms of like visioning or future, and I always remember when um, we sat down, we did your desire statement of what you want to achieve going forward, and you had your goals for your business, your brand that you wanted to do, and I always remember you had your goal for Uganda, was it, that you wanted to travel to? Yes, we did that. I was very excited by your giraffe story, um, but mine was, and that's still on my bucket list, but uh, yes, gorillas. I'm fascinated by gorillas. Uh, David, my husband, who's six foot three and is French Huguenot, has quite a tanned skin, so I think somebody possibly might have been a bit naughty in his past. So we have always called him a gorilla because he's got quite long arms. It's very dark. Yes, yeah, so he was called Dave the Gorilla. When my, my brother called him that, when before we were married. And so yeah, we've always been very excited about seeing gorillas. And it took forever. It was on my vision board for so long. And it took years. We finally went last year. So good. And I remember we wrote that down. If you were to look back at that desire statement that you wrote then, would you say, the majority of it has come to fruition? I don't know about the majority, but I think words came from that for me, using words. So I think of you as a very intelligent woman. And for my whole life, I have said, I'm not very clever, I'm not smart. I, I think I'm streetwise, but I'm not clever. I'm not academic in any way. And I think you, taught me you're part of that journey of the words that I use about myself so I should never say that out loud. Mm, what a very interesting observation. I think there's people listening though that are super inspired by your story that at 53 you have this opportunity and now you know eight years in or six years in you're still you're doing this and, and more and more is coming from it. What would you say to someone because I think a lot of people you know turning 50 they might think oh you know the best years are are kind of over or coming up for 60 the best years are over you've gone and, and done something so different so out there what would you say to someone that's maybe sitting there going I oh, wish I could do this or life is not over for me yet well it isn't unless you allow it to be it, it is it is a choice everything in life is a choice whether I choose to sit on the sofa and eat Maltesers, which probably would have been my first choice if I was. Oh, I love Maltesers. I bought some today, but I'm quite happy buying them and putting them in a drawer. It's a weird thing that I have. As long as I bought it, I know it's there. I don't need to eat it. How many packs did you find in your move then? <laughs> oh, they do get eaten. <laughs> But uh, that would be at the weekend and and that would, I don't know, Saturday night, David and I would sit and share a packet of Maltesers. Or on the aeroplane, because calories don't count on the aeroplane. Absolutely, absolutely. So if someone's there thinking, you're saying, you know, it only you only give up or it only ends when you decide to give up. And is that something that you've consciously chosen? I'm not doing it. There's still so much more I can be doing. And fighting perceptions, because we have changed. We have all grown so much. What in the last, what was your, well, I was going to say, what's your mother like in her 50s, but she's only in her 50s and she is incredible and you are very lucky to have those genes. But for me, my mother, who is 78 in her 50s, was a very different 50 to 50s now. And, you know, going back, her mother would have been and so and so and so. So we need to not be satisfied, I think, with the way that young people or men think we should be. You should be what you want to be because you are capable of being anything you want to be. So how do you manage that when you keep getting backlash against that? Because I'm sure you've had your fair share of backlash or people telling you it's not possible or, you know, be the granny in the photo shoot. You know, how does that affect your confidence and how do you deal with it? I'm not going to give up. I'm, I'm excited to be 60 and the sky is the limit. I, I, yes, I'm going to be knocked back. Yes, I apply for jobs I don't get, but we are all individuals. If I didn't get the job, I wasn't the right person for the job, but there will be another job that I'm right for. And so as long as I'm out there poking people and saying, hello, I'm still out here, 
which I'm going to do, that's, it's important that in our 50s and 60s, we are still middle-aged. We are probably going to live until we're 100, yeah. all being well. As long as they bring a pill out that's gonna, I don't know, stop my crepey skin or, um, I don't know, stop aging somehow. That would be amazing and I'll be first on the list to take it. Have you got plans for your big birthday? Oh no, no, we've got David's first. David's next year, he's 60 next year. So no, 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 not thinking that far in advance. I'd like to get remarried to him before, um, but maybe we'll do that when I'm 60. Oh, food for thought. How many years have you been married then? 31 years this year. Oh, it's 31 years, wow. Mm. Mm. Love it. So what's the secret to a, a long lasting marriage? I think, again, accepting that you're both annoying. I'm always telling people David's very annoying, but actually I'm equally annoying. And knowing that the grass isn't greener, I think. Why would I want to train a new one? <laughs> and, and David would probably, probably say the same. Nobody is perfect. Nice, nice, nice. Where can people find you and follow your stories when you do post them and your journey of, you know, where you're to next and to get to your half a million followers on Instagram? That's going to be a post in itself. Yeah, that will be. Um, when you said where are people going to find you, I was going to say probably Costa. <laughs> <laughs> Um, where are you going to find me? On uh, Instagram for sure and I do respond to my DMs. I have talked about everything that I have done to myself because I do believe it's important for us to share what we've done whether you like it or you don't like it. Don't give me a hard time because I've done it because it was my choice and if you don't like it then we're obviously not in the same tribe. Uh, yes, yeah, so on my website um, I have written down everything that I have done to myself and I'm very happy that I have. Thank you so, so much for sharing your honest journey of um, where, what, where you started, where you're going. I've loved watching it from when we first met so where, to, to where you are now and where you continue to go. Thank you for sharing and inspiring others that, uh, you know, not to give up and to keep going. Well, I know you're not going to give up, Kelly, because you are amazing and I love listening to you speak. Thank you so much. Uh, you really command the room, so um, I'm always impressed. Thank you, Caroline. It was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Bye.